Okay, everybody, let's, uh, let's get going because we've got a packed program and we've got a great report to launch. So uh, it seems like ages ago, and I think it actually was ages ago, that the very excellent Dr. Michael Horsworth of the Behavioural Insights team came and said, would the Institute for Government be interested in collaborating with the Behavioural Insights team on a report about applying behavioural, behavioural insights to the process of government decision making itself? Uh, we leapt at the chance, um, Mindspace, written uh, in the Institute for Government, but by people who are now the moves and shakers in the Behavioural Insights team, uh, David Halpern and Mike himself, uh, is still, I think, the Institute for Government's most downloaded report. And the thought of trying to Mindspace government was just too tempting uh, to resist. So that's because David's arrived on cue, just as I mentioned him. So we're absolutely del delighted to have another chance to work with Mike, who some of you who are avid readers of the Institute's back catalogue on policymaking will realise is a, uh, a key former member of staff here and produced some of our really excellent long-lasting work on improving policymaking. Highly recommended for those of you that haven't dipped back recently. So how today is going to run very quickly is that we're absolutely delighted to welcome Alex Chisholm. Alex is the Permanent Secretary at Bayes, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. You all knew that, of course. Alex is just going to give us some brief reflections on the sort of civil service reaction to this report. Um, there's been a lot of interest. The report has a forward from Jeremy Hayward uh, in it. Alex then, unfortunately, although he would have loved to spend the day with us because he thinks this is really interesting, that's what he's told me, has to go off to a meeting at one o'clock. We were just debating whether this report doesn't suggest that actually his time might be better spent staying with us than going to another civil service meeting. But uh, anyway, Alex has to leave. Then Mike is going to give you a brief tour of the highlights of the report, assuming you haven't all read it on the internet this morning. Uh, we'll then get some very quick reactions about actually how does this feel to people who've been very closely engaged trying to bridge the gap between civil servants and ministers. Uh, Polly McKenzie, director of Demos, but crucially uh, policy director for Nick Clegg when he was deputy prime minister, if you can all remember back to the coalition. And Tony Curzon Price, who is currently economic advisor to Greg Clark in the Department of Business. Uh, energy and industrial strategy. There'll be, then be loads of time for you to pepper them all with your comments, insights and questions. So that's how it's going to run. This is all being live streamed and on the record. So if you're a civil servant, uh, pay due attention to anything you might want to say. That's a reminder as well to Alex. Thank Alex, you. delighted right. to have you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jill. And, uh, uh, welcome, everybody. Um, just by way of a bit of further introduction about myself, as well as being now a civil servant uh, and previously one, I did have about uh, 15 years working in business, uh, including running a small company as well as a large one. Then you have to think a lot then about what customers uh, actually want and trying to anticipate their wishes. So that sort of got me interested in the subject of behavioral economics. Then when I was running the Competition and Markets Authority, uh, where Tony also worked, uh, we obviously tried to apply behavioral economics to understanding the way markets worked. And now I'm trying to sort of complete the set by trying to bring some of those um, uh, sort of disciplines uh, to uh, the business of government decision making. I want to start with a quotation. Uh, Out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Uh, famous quotation from Kant that was popularized, I think, by Isaiah Berlin. And I think the sort of the essence of that is that, you know, people are extremely complicated. Um, but also that, uh, as the metaphor says, there is, there is a kind of a, a construct there. There is an architecture. You can study that. It's not just random. It's not a, a black box. So even though it's crooked, the timber, there is a timber there to be seen. Um, and that, I think, is, is really sort of, um, was if like a foundation text for behavioral science over 40 years, um, which has been very focused on consumers and citizens, but obviously really applies to ourselves as decision makers and as advisors to other decision makers. So, that's really the essence, I think, of this report, is trying to say we can have behavioural government. The government, too, um, can be improved by understanding how that construct works. If I could switch the metaphor, it's not just about um, people and about how complicated um, we are, but also about the situations in which decisions are made. So if, like, the whole machinery there, the institutional context uh, makes a huge difference. The processes 
we follow the interplay between events and information and reaction. Um, so there are different metaphors. I want to use a quote from um, Roland Barthes. If you want to understand what time is, you need to take apart a clock. So that, I think, again, is, is very um, nicely describes what this whole approach in this report is trying to do, is trying to say, well, let's have a look at the machinery. Let's have a look at the cogs. How exactly do we get to this decision? Typically, I may say a bad decision. We're going to study bad decisions more. Um, we should probably study good decisions as well, because they've also got their cogs, and the cogs there worked helpfully. Um, but that, uh, that, I think, is, is the essence of, of, of what's um, being looked at there. Um, the way they kind of bring it to light is really through um, examples and decisions. And most of us, we process narrative better. And some of them are really brilliant ones. I, I used to work for Michael Hesseltine when I first worked in the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, I wasn't involved in the decision he took that you talk about there around coal mines. But I certainly you know, reacted very, very sort of warmly to that and understanding that Hesseltine was actually quite a good decision maker, typically speaking. But the advice he got from his team um, uh, when they were working on the, the closing down of, I think it was 31 of the last 50 British coal mines. And, uh, and they announced it, and they thought it was going to be fine. You know, that was, that was okay at that stage. Uh, and they had to do this huge U-turn because they'd had a sort of a framing problem that, you know, they, the, the policy wonks working on it, and you know, I've sort of been one of them, so I'm not doing that in a derogatory way, um, uh, is, um, you know, they had seen this as being the kind of the, you know, the exciting new frontier of privatization. But that wasn't the way in which everybody else saw it. That framing was just only used within the team. Externally, it was the kind of undertaker to the coal industry, and that felt as like a sad event. And they felt they knew what they were doing. They had this illusion of similarity, which is a classic bias type problem. You think, you know, you think you're in a situation that you recognize. This is a sort of Rolodex mind type problem, but actually it's not. It's a completely new situation. Um, they had their internal debates, but the, you know, they felt that the, um, there was sort of in-group reinforcement. They didn't really listen to what the outside group had. They, they kind of settled that amongst themselves, and that was good enough. And they just carried on in defiance of any alternative view to the contrary. The plan was also secretive. It was jealously guarded. So again, things made in secret are often not very good, because if you'd actually publish them, people would say there's a fatal flaw with it, and you'd have had to try and um, improve it. So sec secretive things are not good. And they were heads down, not heads up. They were, quote unquote, mesmerized by the detail. You know? And I think we would all recognize that, those of us who've been working in policy, as that, that, those, those patterns of problems. Another fantastic text um, to look at, if you haven't read it, Tony King and Ivor Cruz's famous book, Blunders of Our Government. It's so good. Uh, and a lot of the examples in there, um, again, talk to the kind of the, um, the problems of these biases working um, their way through um, decisions. They've got a beautiful case study there on the poll tax, um, which certainly sort of people in my generation will remember very much. I know a lot of younger people here. But um, that, that was the kind of the Brexit of his day, in a way, as a big issue that was sort of wrecking the government. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, or challenging the government, I should say. Um, uh, <laughs> excellent. Um, and the, the issues that came there were kind of around framing the problems, the illusion of similarity, the, the kind of group think, the confirmation bias, the secrecy, the kind of you know, possibly a bit of hubris there and sort of not talking to the people who knew better about it. Um, all of that, you know, you see those patterns replicating themselves, so it's really good to study those ones to make sure that we don't be like that. And something that came through very strongly there was about the sort of the wish fathering the thought. Um, and uh, um, again, if I could say that, you know, we're, we're two years into the Brexit process, and if you like, one way of looking at the tensions that we've, you know, are constantly reminded of there is this sort of gap between the situation that people think they're in, perhaps would like to be in, and then the situation they're actually in. And trying to kind of reconcile that has obviously caused, if we look back, um, and I were thinking a whole series of resignations recently is partly explained by people who, who found that tension very hard. Um, go back to an earlier stage, it does seem like a lot longer ago, but January of last year, Ivan Rogers resigned in a way. He too was resigning because I think he felt that the what was being planned and proposed compared to the situation we're in. There was a big gap between those two things. So, so trying to kind of narrow that gap, trying to make sure that as good civil servants and policy advisors, we can help people to update their thinking, to try and see the situation as nearly as possible to what it actually is, um, and not just what people would wish it would be, or maybe have even described to other people as being. That is the heart of what we can do, I think, as good civil servants learning from these earlier examples. Um, a couple of other things. I mean, the, uh, 
the report is incredibly valuable in naming some of the, um, the biases that we're under. Um, and as we know, as a sort of general point, if you, don't, if you, if you name something, if you're clear on what the, what the issue is, you study it, then you can, um, you can understand it much better. And that report and all the kind of other works in papal science are very useful like that. And the previous publications of BIT, including David's um, on the nudge unit. Um, the, um, but I think there are also, um, it rightly says there are some things that we can do um, to try and uh, not be overcome uh, by our biases. Um, and they were really in two broad categories in the report. It says awareness and training on the one hand, and on the other hand, institutions, structures, and processes. And I think my take on that would be we need to focus a lot more on the second of those. I think if awareness and training was enough, then that would be quite relatively easily solved. And yet, you know, my experience at Tony too, we, we've worked a lot over the last few years on uh, the retail energy market. And if the retail energy market, which we've ended up capping through Parliament, which is not a brilliant solution everyone would recognise, but is the best available solution, now why we ended up with something which is kind of quite a radical institutional innovation like that um, is because we felt that, you know, uh, giving people lots of choice and lots of information it clearly didn't seem to be enough. Um, and there was this huge gap between the prices being paid by consumers who shopped around or well informed and others, a gap of about £300. Um, and that this sort of equilibrium that it established was quite unhealthy, but it was also quite stable. And we didn't see about anything that could really change that in the short term. And so, you know, the CMA came up with lots of ideas, Ofchem did some more, and Parliament now has added to that with the price cap. But those are quite strong institutional um, interventions. They're not just about awareness. Um, so we can probably learn a bit from what's been happening in this kind of market uh, economic regulatory theory as well. Um, some, a few sort of good habits that we can do in the institutional and structural and process place. Some examples I wanted to use. So, um, one is obviously we all know about the problems of groupthink, um, and they are again another uh, beautiful text to read. There is um, uh, is the um, uh, the Chalkett report, um, and uh, if you haven't read it, at least read the, the summary because it's got some really good advice there about sort of when we're getting into that groupthink and some things you can do about it. Simple techniques a lot of us use is sort of um, red team type operations. Um, you can construct those. Um, go externally, ask the IPA, ask the NAO, ask the, the NIC, the OBR, the IFG. There's lots of people to kind of test your things with or the BIT themselves. Um, uh, you can build it into institutional processes. When we were taking merger decisions at the CMA and before that at the Office of Fair Trading, we created, we said that any, any important decision, you had to have somebody who was the de devil's advocate and their sole role was to argue the opposite case for the company saying there's no problem here at all. And it introduced a completely different sort of dynamic to the debate because the sort of case team generally kind of, they get comfortable with a particular view of the world and then they're under great time pressure and they write it up and they kind of try and resist you know, other people who are challenging that. To have somebody to say, no, 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 there is a completely alternative way of looking at this problem was a very healthy um, way of having a kind of, you know, a contest over it, a debate about it. Another way of trying to get the, get the debate going is to be, is to try and attach numbers or values to things rather than just words. When you think about the history of kind of like advice to ministers, so much of it is beautiful words and not enough data. Um, so, you know, the famous sort of, you know, Sir Humphreyisms about sort of, you know, that would be, um, you know, a bold decision or that would be an interesting decision. You're kind of, you're meant to kind of un infer from this that there's something a bit risky about it. But nowadays, people are asked to say, what actually is that risk? Is it 30%? Is it 60%? Is it 90%? The lawyers have to do that now. You know, the, the finance team has to do that. And that's much better. Not because it's automatically free of bias, because those themselves reflect assumptions, but it, it surfaces the assumptions and it makes them contestable. And other people can say, you must be joking. It's not 30%. It's 50%. And, and you get a debate going. But you can't have a debate about that being interesting or bold. It's, it's, it's not really a, uh, a controvertible statement. So those are useful things as well. Um, last couple of examples, then I'll hand over to uh, Mike. Um, the um, reference benchmarking and reference forecasting is extremely useful and valuable. Um, and being a bit confessional, my own department or inherited deck before used to do a huge amount of forecasting itself about the future demand on electricity. And I've, I've been quite firm with them, saying, stop trying to think that you've got the best answers. Just say what everybody else thinks and, and say we're going to be in the middle of that or, and show that range distributions. And um, that, I, I think, can help. Um, uh, 
pre-mortem. So we started doing pre-mortem. So pre-mortem is like you sort of have to imagine the corpse in front of you and say, how did it die? Your lovely project, you know, your program. Um, and actually getting people going, and also it's quite inclusive. It gets lots of people, the whole team, you've got a big team, you've got 85 people on smart meters. You get them all together and say, well, what could go wrong? You get some really interesting ideas, um, uh, including things you haven't thought of before. And especially if you then make sure that you drive that to action, because we're very good in government, as we know, of, you know, of recognizing risks, but not actually grabbing them and reducing them, um, or talking about lessons, but not really applying them. So try to, to use that to drive action. Um, and probably most importantly of all, go small uh, at the beginning and test it. I mean, you know, that's obviously a great finding from all behavioral economics and randomized consumer tests and things are very useful, control tests are very useful. But I think we can do that just generally in government. That's probably the single most important thing is the instincts for the politicians in a hurry and wanting to make a big impact and deliver for the public is to go big, you know, to go maximum. And I think in a way, if there's a lot of uncertainty, go small at the beginning, do a test, do a little geographical area, do some sub-segment. And if we can do that and make sure we have a very informed and evidence-based uh, debate, uh, have a real contest, be very clear about what biases we're under and what biases will be shaping the behavior of the decision makers if it's not us, um, and, and test things out, then we'll make better quality decisions in the future. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Alex. <laughs> So um, Alex has, uh, has given you actually quite a good canter through some of the top lines from the reports and some of the examples. But now we're going to go in a bit more depth with graphs. And so it's a great pleasure to welcome back to the Institute for Government, just flown in from New York, where he's now heading up Behavioral Insights North America, as Behavioral Insights uh, are the UK's most successful export. Uh, Behavioral Insights North America, Dr. Michael Horsworth. We'll just manage the choreography of two people getting off the stage. <laughs> Thanks very much, Hill. Thanks, yeah. everyone, for coming today. Um, so what I want to do now is um, just give some... Can someone brief, turn their oh, mobile? I'll first of all, let Alex depart. <laughs> um, I just want to give some brief uh, highlights of the report um, that might bring it live to people and maybe provoke some questions uh, for later. So first thing to say um, is why do we think about this issue? Um, partly because there's been a lot of interest in applying behavioral science to government over the last um, 10 years. Um, and in fact, we were created as a team in 2010 um, precisely to do this. Um, but what often comes up as a topic is, well, that's all very well, um, but isn't government itself vulnerable to a whole set of biases and couldn't a lot of this thinking be applied to itself? To which we generally said, yes, that's true, um, but then we didn't have a better answer. Like we knew it was an issue, um, but we hadn't fully thought it through, um, perhaps because uh, the incentives ourselves weren't set up that way. Um, but it's been something that's been on our minds, and I'm very glad we finally got around to looking at it in some depth. And I think part of the reason we want to talk about it was we were part of government, we're still partly owned by government, and we've seen some of this stuff at first hand, and we wanted to, to talk about it and work out what we can do. So. You've got to have some kind of framework. Uh, this is the one we developed for this report. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, the people who are here today have the executive summary, um, which gives a brief um, overview of each of the elements that we talk about here. Um, if you just don't just read the executive summary, I would say, mm -hmm. there are really interesting things in the full report, including many examples that bring it to life and make more sense of this. But for example, you can talk about things like framing, which is on the far left-hand side, which is about how the presentation and selection of an issue or information can really affect how people react to it and what decisions are taking, perhaps more so than some of the substantive content. This, the angle you take on something can be as important as what you're talking about itself. And we have given many examples in the report of how e quite large differences can come about through just apparently small differences in presentation. And this goes to the heart of many things that come onto the policy agenda uh, today and in the past. Um, however, I want to bring it to life by giving you some, some practical example. So let's talk about one of the issues called confirmation bias. And essentially, this is where um, your pre-existing views guide what information you notice and how you interpret information. It can lead to people 
uh, rejecting opposing arguments, even if they're good ones, simply because they uh, have a very strong attachment to their pre-existing opinions. And in fact, what can happen is something that was shown by uh, an experiment with Danish politicians, which is what I'm going to talk about now. So you take uh, about 250 elected um, councillors in Denmark, and if you give them um, this relatively simple um, puzzle uh, in the top left-hand corner, ignore the bottom right for now, which school is performing better? Now, um, you'll see that schools are labelled School A and School B. And it takes some basic maths to work out um, which school is performing better. You have to work out the percentages mm -hmm. in a very crude sense. Now, if you give that um, problem to the politicians, uh, around uh, three quarters get it right. That's 75%. Um, if, however, you present the same numbers um, in a different way, in the bottom right-hand corner, as private school and state school. So, in other words, one is publicly funded, one is uh, privately funded. Then something very interesting happens to the results. Essentially, they divide along uh, political uh, lines, and uh, party political, and indeed, ideological lines. So let me explain this graph to you. First of all, um, what this shows on the left-hand axis is the percentage of the uh, politicians getting the answer right. Okay? Um, and then if you go over to the right-hand side here, on the right-hand side are the answers uh, for the politicians who had the strongest level of support for public services, who be really believed in public services. Okay, and if you take the blue line, the blue line is for when this public school was doing best, when the correct answer was the public school is doing best. What you'll find is that 90% of the people who really believed in public services got it right. So in other words, the answer was in line with what they wanted to be true. If you then go over to the left, for the people who believe the opposite, so they don't really believe in public services, only 40% got it right. And the reverse is true the other way. Um, you can see there's almost complete reversal here. So essentially, when people are getting an answer that is what they want to be true, they get it right. And when the answer is not what they want to be true, the actual uh, ability, you could argue it's the ability to work out the answer, or at least the refusal to answer uh, what they don't want to be true, is very powerful. Now, this is a bit of a challenge to the uh, view that you just have to give the best possible evidence, that policy, improving policymaking is purely a matter of more, better evidence um, into the process. Because confirmation bias can be an incredibly strong uh, uh, rejection of, of evidence. And we, the point here, it's not just theoretical. These are real politicians who are actually the ones in charge of education budgets. The other thing we can do is work out uh, what lies behind some of the issues we know to already to be true. So it's not going to be news to many people that governments are often overconfident. There's much evidence from the last eight years that we tend to um, underestimate how long it takes to complete a project. Um, some great studies showing that you know, collective costs of 90 billion pounds over uh, many, many years, and generally speaking, overestimating, um, uh, sorry, underestimating the amount of time and cut money by about 30%. This has been known. We set up uh, things like the uh, infrastructure, uh, major infrastructure projects uh, uh, agency to deal with this. But what I think is really interesting and is new is we're beginning to see what lies underneath some of this. So this is a study um, with uh, politicians from Belgium, Israel, and Canada. So again, real elected politicians. And what they did was they, um, they first of all, asked them how confident they were they would get re-elected. Okay? And then they tried to develop a more objective uh, measure of how likely they were to get re-elected based on opinion polling and past performance. And if you put those together, you get what they call the overconfidence index. Okay, and that's represented along the bottom. And what they also asked them to do was make, uh, make a series of decisions where they could take a risky option or a less risky option. And what they found and what this graph shows is that the more overconfident people were in their chance of getting re-elected, the more likely they were to take the risky option. 
there was no relationship between the objective measure of getting re-elected and risk-taking. It was purely about overconfidence. And that's a bit troubling because if you're overconfident, you're also less likely to have an accurate understanding of your abilities and chances of success. So there's also a problem of this notion of risk-taking being bound up in overconfidence. And well, there is another study, which we talk about in the report, where exactly the same thing is shown for civil servants or elect, unelected officials in the US around climate change. And what that also shows is that it's the more senior people who are the most overconfident. Again, that's troubling because they're the ones most likely to be in positions of power. So we're getting under some of these issues we knew were, were problematic and working out some of the wider problems associated and why they might occur. And then, Alex conveniently already mentioned this, um, here are some of the headlines associated with this, um, the, the issue of closing the coal mines, which we talk about because we, want, we also, in the report, want to bring it to life through real examples. Um, I won't go through it again because Alex covered it, it exactly right, but it's a very good example of how many of the biases we talk about play out in real life. And what's also interesting is, if you look at the bottom, we now have access to the internal papers from the time, just been released, which actually provided a, a contemporary diagnosis of what went wrong. So I urge you to have a look in the report on that case study, which brings a lot of the biases to life. So it's not purely abstract. We don't just talk about some kind of experiments all the time. We also try and relate it to uh, real life. What can we do? Um, we present a whole series of um, proposals in the report. I'm not going to talk about them all, but I just want to talk very quickly about three. So, and actually, each of these three ones are linked to the noticing, deliberating, and uh, executing phases. So the first one is around reframing. So we know that frames are really important. I mentioned this a bit, the way th issues are presented. And this can present one problem because policymakers can kind of get locked into their own way of interpreting issue uh, maybe one that's influenced by their department, their institution, and fail to see how it can be presented differently, or how it might be interpreted differently. So we pr present some ways in the report, I won't go into them, of how you can reframe your own understanding and prevent getting locked in the narrative and getting surprised later by different interpretations. But it can also go further, it can help when there are issues, uh, intractable um, controversies, which seem... Basically, the two sides can't talk to each other because they don't, they don't have a common language. And we set out some ways that this is because they've got different frames. How can we bridge those different interpretations? We use the example of um, a development of a woodland, for example. You might have an environmental frame on it, you want to protect the woodland, or you might have a, an economic development frame where it's all about stimulating the local economy. And we show how you can actually, in practical ways, bridge that gap through reframing the issue. The way things, uh, you make symbolic concessions one side that means little to you, but actually is really important for someone else. Alex mentioned red teaming. Red teaming is this idea, which is used in the military a lot, that you take a team which is specifically um, set up to challenge an existing proposal or system. Um, so we think this is a good idea and it's been used, but one potential problem here is that we know from social psychology that if um, someone is seen as an out-group, not part of your group, you are less likely to believe them and take their opinions seriously. You're more likely to defensively reject what they're saying. So we think there's a role here of doing it slightly differently. And if you are part of a team developing a policy, at some point, some of you can split off and act as the challenge that comes in later. So you're not seen as purely like the other group that's come in to do everyone down you see that you have a common frame of reference and a common starting point, and you're just trying to make things better. So that's how I think we can put a twist on some existing ideas, which are still not used that often. And as Alex mentioned, pre-mortems are an idea that often talked about, but not used that often. And they essentially are a way of trying to get rid of this optimism bias, um, which I mentioned. So you, you assume, you make a big effort to project forward and assume that your policy failed, because otherwise you have a great tendency to think your policy is going to succeed. Why did it go wrong? Can we go back, work back from that failure and work out why? And this tends to work because it gives people license and a, an ability and space to um, think uh, about problems, which they don't really have incentives to do otherwise because people often don't want to be the person who raises the uncomfortable issue. <coughs> 
Um, so that's what I want to talk about today. What's really great is we've had a positive reception from um, civil service and government, and um, we're working to incorporate some of these lessons into the way government works, and I hope to be able to, we can share some of those uh, that progress in the future. But for now, thank you very much for your time today. Thank forward. you, Mike. <laughs> so, so I'm now going to invite Polly McKenzie and Tony Curzon Price to join us on the stage and just give some sort of quite snappy reactions to if Polly can disentangle her microphone from the chair. Excellent. Sorry. So, just some very sort of quick reactions. You had a look at the report, what resonated, what didn't. And I think the critical thing about uh, Alex, I thought, was very interesting about, you know, can we actually redesign some of the institutions and structures to re reduce at source some of the potential risks of biases? So, Polly, do you want to just kick off with some, uh, some preliminary thoughts and then we'll open it up to the audience for their reactions and have a bit of biff bat? Uh, I thought it was an absolutely fascinating report and really... Um pleased to see it produced. Um, it's interesting when you go through some of the analysis that's wrong, a lot of it's associated with sort of what's wrong with politicians. So I've just caught the eye of one. Uh, but he's a good guy, don't worry. Um, uh, but there's actually a lot of the proposals are about lots of stuff that will go on in quite sort of in the weeds of the civil service. And I wonder what we can do um, to in fact change or support politicians. I actually think most politicians are good guys, right? Like, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't subscribe to the notion that they're all just malevolent forces trying to get elected for their own ill-gotten gains, right? N nevertheless, there are a complicated set of motivations that affect how politicians uh, decide their objectives and how they, in, how they act, both on a kind of short and long-term basis. Uh, and, you know, one of the, I don't know if it, technically is a behavioural insight, but um, one uh, that I have is that nobody makes a good decision when they're knackered, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, we still have this system whereby it's kind of completely normal for very senior ministers making incredibly important decisions to be signing things off in the middle of the night, either at home going through their red box at midnight or kind of getting up in the morning because they're going to do it when they're fresh at 5 a.m., and you th the number of times that I sat on a train with Nick Clegg and watched him just kind of fall asleep on the train because he was knackered. And you think, is he, is he bringing his kind of considerable intellect and the intellect that you know, other ministers will have to bear on these decisions? And so you get to the point where, you, where a minister then appoints people around them, special advisors and, and policy advisors, who he knows will have, he or she, um, uh, will have his best, his or, you know, whatever I mean best mm -hmm. interests at heart, so that when they are making bad decisions, somebody will correct them. Or when they're kind of in a bit of a mm -hmm. fog, somebody, somebody else will help to kind of shore them up. And so there becomes this kind of institution around, uh, around the minister um, for successful ministers. A and I wonder what, in fact, we should do to, to find a way so that you're not just uh, learning techniques to sort of manipulate a minister. Yeah, everyone knows the sort of the Humphreyisms, the that's a brave decision. And then, the, you know, the basic kind of framing techniques of putting the option you want them to choose as the middle one so that it looks like a sensible compromise. Uh, and then, you know, there's, you chuck in the do nothing scenario so that it look, it, and when the minister, uh, yeah. but then the ministers have, I was talking to one uh, Lords Minister recently and he took, he, he wanted to take an initiative. He said, the best thing for me to do is to ask my team, have they thought of any ideas to deal with this particular problem? I'm not going to tell them I've already thought of what the answer is. I'm just going to ask them if they have. And then they'll come to me with three or four proposals, and I'll say, yes, those are great, but have we thought about this as well? Because his view, after kind of a year of experience, was that that was a much more successful way to get them to feel like... I don't know, like the, the policy, some, or the idea belonged to them, rather than having that quite, um, quite uh, aggressive sort of relationship that you can get, where the civil service can become a kind of institution resisting the minister. Sometimes, often in fact, because they think it's uh, in the best interests of the minister not to take this risk. I'm really struck by the idea that risk-taking behaviour is necessarily a bad thing. I think. I, look at where the Prime Minister is right now. You know, she's finally taken a risk, and for the first time in a year, she looks like a Prime Minister. 
It's not to say that I like all the details and whether it will work or not, but just suddenly it's, you need to take a step forward. And there is that kind of role for our leaders as a country and also in, a, in the civil service. Sometimes you just need to take a decision. Sometimes you need to move forward. Sometimes there's uh, the ticking negotiations of a treaty just kind of coming at you and you've just got to take action. So I wonder if we need to do a bit more thinking. I'd love kind of questions or thoughts from, on this. It, how, how, do we, how do we change the motivations and the mechanisms of politics as well as things about you know, how you structure? teams within the civil service. Paula, that's really interesting. I'm going to ask Mike for some reactions, but we'll hear from Tony first. Tony, some of your initial reactions. You seem to be um, drawing on your iPad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. In fact, we took the report to heart, me and Alex, as we were discussing it. Uh, uh, you know, I, I red teamed and I thought, okay, I'm going to be the one that plays devil's advocate on the <laughs> report. So, you know, already having influence. Um, uh, so, I th picking up on something you said, I, I think there's a, so imagine you read this report and you get really good at identifying uh, biases and you're sitting in a, in a meeting with a minister and you remember your training and you say, ah, oh, minister, I understand why you're saying this. You're saying this because you're biased in this particular way. <laughs> Doesn't go down well, right? There's a real, what's really interesting and I think we do this a lot, and economics does this a lot. What's really interesting is that there are two, you know, we, we operate at two levels. We operate at a causal level at which we say this is the causes of the decisions that we come out of. And yet, as participants in decisions, we have to treat each other as uh, rational, reasonable, uh, uh, conversational beings, right? And if you treat someone as merely a cog that is behaving in a certain way, then in fact, you're sure to make them very, very angry, right? I mean, it, it happens in, in, in uh, all sorts of places where if you try and tell people why they believe something and say, oh, you know, there's something very dismissive about that. So I think that that's, so, so it's very, you know, it, doesn't mean that we shouldn't have causal theories of how decisions come about, but it does mean, I think, that what we have to realise is that, we're, that the output of this whole process is collective social decisions. And collective social decisions, as you have said, are enormously complicated things, and it's very, very unclear that there is any right answer that any one has a privileged perspective to deliver on this question of uh, how much risk should people take? Well, we know very well in the private sector, all sorts of people often will say, well, what we need is a CEO that's going to take lots of risks here. So in a sense, you choose the uh, biases that you want and you put them in the positions that you want. Now, because you can't treat people merely as uh, machines that are going to be manipulated and because we actually don't really know how a whole collection of biases produces a social outcome. I think what Alex said is really important, which is that we need to mostly take the ex extremely good and interesting uh, uh, thinking about biases in this report and think about, well, what are the, how do our institutions and procedures actually work? And you can do that at the micro level of the procedures for an individual meeting and the sorts of things that you described. But we also need to think of it at the systemic level. So if you think about how do we decide what level of risk to take on in some massive scale social decision, I don't know, our energy mix, for example, something I haven't oh. been involved in, or our industrial strategy, another one. A lot of things there are risky. But, and, and the risk, if you think about the outcome of that, the, 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 the decision that we make is an outcome that has input from risk-taking politicians, input from extremely risk-taking low-stake media, input from extremely disinterested civil servants. All this is going into a machine which produces an outcome. And in that sense, the social body is rather like the individual body that behavioral economics has been so good at. Uh, untangling, so good, but still pretty mysterious, right? All these things come into the person and a belief uh, and a set of actions come out. All the things come into the entire social system and the decision comes out. This is pretty, this is a, this is a, a, a mysterious uh, process. 
But obviously, it's one in which justice for the individual, the more we understand, the more uh, we're going to be able to, we, we may be able to control. Like one of the very striking things in the report, there are lots of touches of extreme uh, unflinching honesty in it. One of the most intriguing was bias bias. So bias bias is uh, the finding by which uh, if, the more, if you're more aware of biases, you may be more likely to succumb to them because you say to yourself, oh, I'm aware of this bias, so obviously I'm not going to fall for it, and that liberates you to fall for it. <laughs> so so, so uh, uh, anyway, more, more uh, grist to the mill of let's make sure that we translate this into institutional thinking, just as in the behavioral turn in economics, has taken us to say, well, let's think about market design. Here, let's think about institutional design. And just one final point, you make a distinction right at the beginning of the report that says uh, there are two ways to think about policy outcomes. Uh, one of them is programmatic, which essentially means objective, civil servanty, in some form utilitarian, and the other is political, and there, I think you frame the political as being there are narratives that people respond to. Now, just a question, it seems to me that actually this may be an unhelpful frame. That the whole, uh, you know, that, that two things, that there, are, there are two qualities that we want to come out of collective decisions. One is they have to be good in that utilitarian sense. And two, they have to be legitimate. Now, what you've done by saying we are focusing only on the utilitarian is you're saying essentially that the two are separable. I have doubts about the separability of those two and whether framing it is actually something that might lead itself to some mistakes in institutional design. So, thanks very much, Tony and Polly. Some very interesting challenges, particularly on how this resonates with politicians? Is this just basically a handbook for civil servants on how to manipulate their ministers better? Um, and actually, do we sort of underplay the importance of politics in decision making from Tony and how do we redesign the system? So Mike, some very quick reactions. Then it's going to be over to you to um, pepper the panel with com comments and questions. Mike. Yeah, politics. So it's not in the presentation I gave. It's not the executive summary. We talk about it a lot mm. in uh, the first part of the report, though, it's just something that I had to leave out. Mm. It's really important. We think politics is essential to policy making. Um, it just comes to how can you try and do everything with a re one report? Um, probably not. And I think uh, the IFG certainly spent a lot of time working with, with ministers. It's really hard. Uh, it, you end up with things that sort of look weak when you write mm. them down, but are nonetheless true. Um, I So I totally agree. I, I'm. The, the separation um, that you're talking about, Tony, it was a bit of uh, convenience to sort of say, we think it's policy really important, but right now we're, we're focusing on this other side. It's actually a distinction we took from elsewhere. That's a cop-out mm. answer, I know. Yeah. Um, uh, risk-taking, I'm totally not against risk-taking. It was only in the context of overconfidence. I totally agree, risk-taking would be the right decision in many instances. Um, there are other examples uh, I suppose I could have given. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. We don't want to go and say to people, you're biased. The word bias is really unhelpful. I wish there were a different word. Mm -hmm. we, we, and we, we try different words, and it, it, we came back to this one. It's imperfect. Um, we totally recognise it should be more about changing the situation so you don't get into these situations. And indeed, many uh, instances, your initial gut reactions are good ones and work really well. That's something I didn't say. Mm -hmm. It's not always about biases. Um, so I totally take mm. your point about procedures and things on a, a systemic level. So, yeah, thank you. OK, well, let's go to the audience, see if there are any comments or questions. We usually just say questions, but actually I think it's really interesting if anyone got any good things. But keep it quite short, because I imagine there are lots of people who want to, want to come in. We have two roving mics. Uh, so let's come to the front here, Adela. Thanks very much. Tara Alice from McKinsey Centre for Government. I have one comment and one question. So my comment is... Around this thing about risk taking, we recently published a piece of work on government transformations and why 80% of them fail and 20% succeed. And the 20% that did succeed actually required a leader that was willing to take some personal risks in terms of not being re elected. So, 
in a Scandinavian country reforming the education system, they knew they were not going to get re-elected, but they basically knew also they had been dragging their feet for 30 years and they actually fundamentally wanted the country to be better. Or in an Eastern European country, yeah. firing all the corrupt officials in the police force was necessary in order to actually get to the outcomes that citizens wanted. So sometimes that confidence of being re-elected is actually a good thing if you're looking at changes yeah. that take a long time and take require some risk taking by the individuals. So it would be interesting to hear yeah. our reactions to that. My question is, you've very... Um, uh, successfully looked here at policy decision making but an awful lot of government is around deliveries around transformation change management and when I look at change management issues and problems they're all about how do you get people to behave differently and I'm interested in whether you think some of the behavioral economics nudge other kinds of techniques could be used to actually make those transformations more successful so we did have one example I, I will be very brief um, where we found that cost reduction efforts that were framed as using the money to deliver better services for citizens that you were serving were more successful than cost reduction efforts that were framed as we're going to save the money and give it back to Treasury. Okay, I think uh, quite a lot of departments are much more enthusiastic there. Mike, do you want to come back quickly on those and then we'll go here? Um, yes, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, on the second point, we'd have loved to talk more widely. It just becomes such an <laughs> enormous topic. I went, when we first talk, started talking about it, we wanted to go wider. We just talked about budget setting, we think is really fascinating, um, and mm -hmm. the default being carried over, and then the desire to spend in the last few months of the financial year. We, I think that's a really interesting mm -hmm. issue. We, it just became too big, and we needed to focus it down, but it's absolutely right. Um, and I think there's a really interesting question about confidence and overconfidence. There is an argument that overconfidence um, is a good thing in some ways and is quite adaptive and is often sometimes necessary um, to, to go for big issues um, and, and actually try that. Um, I think it's, it can be good on an individual level. I think the bad tends to outweigh the good at a government level overall. Let's go here. Um, Mark Prisk, uh, one of Polly's uh, <laughs> malevolent members of parliament and a former <laughs> business minister 2010-13. It seems to me at the heart of this is a different attitude and appetite for risk. Mm. Politicians, not all, but most, uh, embrace. Civil servants naturally, culturally tend to be averse. Um, but actually, I would say neither species, and I'm obviously mm. one and previously one, um, really actually understands it in the way I frankly see in the private sector. The quantification of risk and the care that's taken with that in the way in which the private sector seems to operate is eons in front of Whitehall, and frankly, Whitehall, obviously, as we know, is eons in front of Westminster. Yeah. What do we do to change those two cultures? Okay, Tony, Ooh. how do we, that sounds <laughs> like, you know, the man at the forefront of energy reform and things like that, um, how do we actually make risk thinking in government more sophisticated? So, that, uh, um, what, a, uh, what a difficult and very <laughs> good question. So as an economist, I've, you, know, you, you, uh, you, you think about risk. So for example, in finance, you think about you know, endlessly, you think about two things. You say, oh, well, there's a, there's a risk return trade-off. You can take more risk, but there's more uncertainty about the, uh, uh, about the, the, uh, uh, on the upside and on the downside. And then in finance, if you're a kind of portfolio manager, what you'll do is you'll go to whatever institution or end individual you're looking after that portfolio for, and you're going to say, um, so what's your risk preference? Now, as you know, behavioral economics has shown, that's actually a really tricky question to answer at the level of the individual. Now, imagine answering that at the level of society. So I think that it's true that the, 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 the private sector has got very, very sophisticated. And in a sense, the finance sector is, a, is an extraordinary risk, um, uh, risk pooling institution. And each element in that risk pooling institution, except for the final managers, are essentially have the discipline of the market to act in a risk neutral given their object risk neutral way given their objective. But I, but that's not what you want what consumers want. So the portfolio manager at the end of the finance chain doesn't want that. And the and society doesn't want risk neutrality either. 
So I think that some of the sophistication of the private sector is a bit illusory, because if you, you know, we, many of us have probably done this, you, you know, your bank asks you to assess your appetite for risk. It's incredibly crude the way it does that. Compared to that, the way in which the political system creates a revealed preference for social risk is extraordinarily sophisticated. So I'd contest the diagnosis. Oh. On that said, I think you're completely right that we need to, you know, we should pre pre present, and we've started to present, risk return trade offs, for example, in energy. We pr started to pre present sort of very sophisticated option, optionality modeling. So one of the very interesting things in the department, and Tara probably knows this, is that very, very good at doing scenarios, but not so good at saying to the minister, actually, you need to take this decision now, or it would be quite good to wait. You're, you're perf you know, it may be urgent not to, to wait, you know, urgent to do nothing. Um, you can wait and your decision, your decision problem is going to change over time. Those are the sorts of things which the finance sector is very on top of. And I think simply is a, you know, there are a whole lot of uh, uh, technical things and ways of thinking that we can change within the civil service. So, Polly, do you think uh, actually sort of getting ministers to think or getting people to, uh, Alex mentioned quantifying as opposed to just the sort of fluffy words that we usually serve up in written submissions might be a way of sort of concentrating the mind of getting people to actually put a number next to it. Do you think that would have helped when you were seeing sort of, you know, decisions being presented to ministers if you'd forced officials to actually crystallise what they thought the, the risks attached to different options were for ministers to be able to have a... A more concrete discussion? I, I, I can see that it would. I mean, just uh, there's, there is this point that risk in the public sector tends to be picked up by the public sector, uh, which is, mm. you know, it's problematic. I mean, the Treasury will always be sceptical about uh, anything that might incur any fiscal mm. risk because they're the people who have to, uh, have to roll in with the bailout. That's why devolution is always kind of hamstrung by this sense, but what if the local authorities screws mm. up? Who picks up the pieces? Well, it's still us. Um, and so I think that will always be a kind of a, a limiting factor. Um, I think, yes, quantifying the risk mm. would be important, but, but actually the first and most important question is to really clarify what the, what the actual objectives are and then how much risk are you willing to take in order to, in order to get there. I, th I think that's a, a question the civil servants struggle to ask, actually. OK, let's go and have... Let's pick up a couple of questions. We've got some people... Tim, Tim, right at the far back corner. If anyone's in the overspill room and wants to ask a question, do come in and keep tweeting away as well. Yes? Uh, hi, Andrew Clamo. Um, as a civil servant, I wondered what the implications of this report are for civil service impartiality, because it seems to, a lot of behavioural insights seem to suggest that any one individual is impacted by a host of uh, biases. So is impartiality actually more a corporate uh, goal than an individual goal, would you suggest? Mike? Mm. Um, probably yes, um, in reality. Um, I think that's why you have institutions, really, um, to try and, in an ideal world, you design institutions to take some of these things into account. Because, um, as I mentioned before, a lot of what we talk about, both here and in general, you can present positively as efficient decision making. And you react and in, in situations and you have, uh, if you like, an automatic response which works very well. So bias is the sort of like, slightly negative way of putting it. Um, so the way I put it is that you can create, there are situations where that uh, natural automatic reaction leads to problematic outcomes. And that's when you're in a system, when you're in an institution. So, of, in a sense, of course, individuals are going to have that kind of reaction. It's only natural. So then the emphasis has to be on trying to design the best possible institution, recognising that's going to occur. Uh, that's going to occur. So, Mike, one of the things that civil servants love is being in meetings with each other and seeing sort of meetings and group discussions as the optimal way of reaching the sort of, you know, best option or maybe best three options to present to the ministers with a clear sort of uh, hint to go for the middle one. I mean, what does this report say actually about the sort of ways in which we've all been brought up over billions of years to conduct business within the civil service? Yeah, um, so I won't go into much detail, but I think there's a whole bunch of stuff we haven't talked about in the middle here about how individuals uh, or groups interact with each other. And I think we've got some the problems that we uh, talk about are 
Firstly, um, you know, groups not always the best way of making decisions. Um, actually, what can happen is groups can come to a more extreme conclusion than individuals might have done because you get feedback from each other, you all agree with each other, and gradually you move to a more extreme position. You, of course, can have majority effects where people don't want to speak up because they don't want to be the person who awkwardly raises the problem. Um, you can also have something which isn't talked about as much where you, in depart different departments, you may even um, reject what, the, what another group is saying because they're from a different department and they're seen as, what, as I mentioned, an outgroup, even if the argument is a good one. Um, and so we, we talk about some, some various different issues here about how you can do this. But one thing I think, I think is really important, interesting, is um, you can address some of these this idea of group reinforcement through having people have different approaches to policy, solving policies. And this is where it goes wider than just the civil service because ministers may have different approach to solving a more creative approach. Whereas we may as an institution create people thinking in very similar ways, which doesn't get that wider input in groups, which could be a big problem. So it's, yeah. uh, um, brought to mind is one of the ministerial meetings we had on um, uh, M um, migrant access to benefits and public services, MAPBAPS, which is the hostile environment kind of thing. Um, and so one of the things that's weird about the civil service, or maybe it happens elsewhere, is, is there's always like pre-meetings to decide what the ministers are going to decide so that the ministers are just sort of robots reading from their brief and not interacting with each other, which always struck me as weird. But there was one of the, one of the pre-meetings, um, they'd been all charged with coming out with new ways of creating a hostile environment. And Biz came with a proposal to make uh, employers liable for back pay for anybody who'd been illegally employed or uh, under the minimum wage. Um, and you know, my assumption was that the, the Tories in particular, that, or people representing those departments, would say, oh, this is a disaster, like cash for illegal immigrants. You can't, you know, you ca it can't be in favor of that. But since Jeremy Haywood was at the meeting and he just said, I love this, this is great creative thinking. And that framed it as an acceptable kind of slightly wacky idea in a way that I just assumed wasn't going to be possible and because it was then framed upwards to a whole lot of people mm -hmm. as quite a creative idea and basically you didn't get your back pay until you'd left the country. It was quite a, quite a, a good idea. I don't know where it ended up. But it was interesting to see the way that a leader, because preying on the fact that everybody wants to impress Jeremy Haywood, right, that's just a sort of standard civil service objective, I think, I think leaders need to make sure that they construct environments that are welcoming and creative because uh, otherwise that and they have a really powerful role to play in combating that group thing. But leaders also need to be careful, don't they? Because you've seen other ones where actually having a leader who sort of you know, eliminates other alternatives very quickly yeah. can actually just shut down quite a useful conversation that other people might be prepared to have. So I think, yeah maybe lucky in Jeremy, but other people might actually use that power of authority and deference in a different way to... Yeah. Okay, another question. Yeah, I'm Hartley Miller, Chester University. Um, I'm looking at this as a, as a behavioral um, insights issue. It seems to me that what we are doing here or discussing is ways to avoid things going wrong, ways to avoid bad decisions. And what seems to be coming through are a lot of processes introducing ways of doing things um, which will help guard against those. But to me, normally, in a behavioral um, approach, one's looking at the incentives for people to actually do these things. And I'm rather clear that if we have introduction of more process, um, introduction of um, standards which have no payoff for the individuals, we're actually um, missing some points. Do the panel have any thoughts as to how we can actually make it more attractive to actually go through the right process, to have the right red team reviews, and then actually feel somehow that you have done a, a better job? At the moment, it seems to me is at the very top level, about the best you can hope for as a politician is to be regarded as being a safe pace of pair of hands. There's not much else that you get out of it because you, you don't believe you're going to take a wrong decision. So, I'd love to take this one. So, I think one of the strengths, the real strength of the report, actually, and uh, is is that it grounds 
this in individual incentives. And one, it seems to me one of the really good examples, and I think we all have experience of this, is, if, is, 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 is thinking about you have meetings in which you sequentially go through asking people for their opinions. And it's quite, I think we all know that it's quite clear that the order in which you ask people to speak changes what gets said and the impression that gets given. Because each person is sitting there thinking, ah, yes, uh, I can't, you know, am I, what role am I going to play? Am I going to play it safe? People are going to judge me about this. This has been said three times. Can I really go against it, etc." So these are all things that are happening in the micro incentives of people. So I think it's wrong to say that it ignores micro incentives, but the question is, how do you solve the problems that are presented by these micro incentives? Because I think that you can't, you know, the fact is people care about their reputations, they care about how they're thought of by a group. Those are all good things about being human. Um, but we then, the reason that we move to an institutional level is we then need to think this does lead to systematic problems. It's a good thing, it's part of people's incentives and deeply part of it. Therefore, we've got to be clever about the games we play. Polly, sort of, should we talk more about incentives? Do you think there are enough incentives inside government to do things right? Uh, yeah, and I, I think I would dispute the idea that this, the, the best thing to be as a politician is a safe pair of hands. It's certainly mm -hmm. a, it's a, it's a safe strategy. It's the one Theresa May tried to adopt in the Home Office mm -hmm. and it got her to be the Prime Minister. I think then being a safe pair of hands as Prime Minister turned out to sort of not work out so well. But if, and, and, and it's, uh, it, it look at what Michael Gove is trying to do by contrast, is that I think he's trying to construct a narrative that he's the guy who went into the Department for Education and, you know, tackled the blob, did a whole bunch of stuff. Then he went over to justice. Big reform agenda, I get stuff done. Now I'm over at uh, DEFRA abolishing plastic. You, I, I think there's a set of incentives there for the storytelling that a politician mm. might to do about mm. themselves to make themselves happy or also in order to kind of fuel their political ambitions that isn't necessarily about not messing up. Uh, but of course, it, it is a more risky strategy. And I, I, th I think those civil servants who support ministers who are trying to achieve things will, will find that they, they make progress. There's, the, there's a danger, though, that mm. political... Um, political systems are always run a bit like a court. I mean, uh, not one with a judge, I mean like Henry VIII, uh, where there's kind of insiders and outsiders and somebody's up and somebody's down and it's all about who can get close to them. And that's why you travel on the train with somebody is so that you can have the informal <laughs> corridor chat or you can, all of that. And, and a lot of that very informal, very political uh, sort of, I guess it, that, that proximity to power can be used as incentives for civil servants, actually. As it's quite interesting. Nick Timmins did a report, which we uh, had an event on here quite a few years ago, about the different health secretaries. And he interviewed all most living health secretaries called window, uh, called window breakers and glaziers. And he basically suggested there were two styles mm -hmm. of minister. And you usually had one after the other. You'd have your great sort of, I need to shake this system up, window breaker and then you had the person who was appointed and hopefully consciously by the Prime Minister as having a more emollient style who was sort of put things back together, calm things down and sort of consolidate and then maybe... Well, and and basis, look at the Home Office, thing. Amber Rudd went in as the Home Secretary and sort of couldn't really change anything mm. because she was taking over from the Prime Minister. And, and then because actually that strategy mm. led her to not have any plausible mm. deniability when it came to future things, mm. Sajid Javid now has, has an opportunity because he's, he's got a political kind of space mm. that's open because of her departure, enables him to specifically do things that he wouldn't otherwise have political permission to do. So, Mike, should we say more about incentives in this report? Is there... I, um, unlike, <laughs> I feel this is, I actually have more sympathy for what you're saying mm. because it is a worry I have when we put recommendations out there, it's like, but re in reality, thinking about people's behavior, will any of it get taken up? It does, it's the worry you have in the back of your mind. And we do try at various instances, both here and elsewhere, to ground it in the reality that is this going to work um, by trying to tap into some of the incentives. But in a sense, you can only go so far when you 
write a report like this or you think it through because it's got to be substantially about some of the leaders in the organization saying this is important and this matters and we, we want to go and invest some time and money in that and I think what's great is that certainly we've had some indication for, in terms of Jeremy Hayward for example writing forward and mm. promoting this approach and Alex for example I have some hope there but then it's got to be sustained and you have to build it in, 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 into the institutions. So I actually see where you're coming from. Like, we come up with some wonderful things that sound good, but do they just fall away because the incentives aren't there? Mm. We'll do our best, but it's always the problem. I think actually one of the most, most interesting insights of the report, and Alex picked it up in his intro, was that <laughs> all our processes tend to prize secrecy, surprise, things like that. Actually, one of the things that this says is actually, you may prize that. You may prize being the person who can pull the giant rabbit out on budget day or whatever, uh, but actually your political career may actually be better by having things that have been more exposed, more opportunity for others to comment earlier before it's set in stone, that you've missed something, you know, more transparency. These actually can all be quite good political strategies as opposed to assuming that keeping absolutely everything to yourself and not engaging and not talking to anyone else is uh, always the best political strategy. I think that's actually, if the civil service and ministers took one theme out of the report, I think that would be quite a good, uh, good take out. Let's have a couple more questions. Uh, so we'll go back there and then we'll come here. So Tim there and Adela here. Yeah, uh, yes, Rob, Robert, oh, sorry. James Vickers, yeah. DFT. Yeah. Um, behavioral science would suggest uh, that at an individual level, people don't always know why they believe things or why they do things. And when they're called on to, uh, when they're asked why they do them or they believe them, they feel judged and therefore come up with some sort of judgmental type uh, defense as if they were in the, in, in the dock. A couple of times in policy work that I've been involved in, it's almost as if the policy's lost its way and people can't remember what the policy was trying to actually deliver in the end. I can think of one a major mm. policy going on at the moment where you could possibly say the same things um, going on, but why are we going through Brexit? Um, so I think what is important here is when the minister is asked, mm. when the policy team are actually thinking through what are the real reasons for this, do they sometimes get lost and what is that emotional drive that actually gets us to state that policy in the first place? Okay, any quick comments on getting lost in the policy process? Um, I think one thing that this taps into is, is confirmation bias where um, actually your preferences or your view or your goal can sometimes mm. occur really quickly or be formed um, mm. uh, almost arbitrarily, but then it's really tenacious. And that's the strange imbalance here. That, and you may forget why it occurred. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you may have, uh, I think, think of instances myself where mm -hmm. developing a policy over a long period of time, you forget how far it moved through the iterations. And actually, you go back occasionally, you go back and say, actually, one of those early versions was better. But we, never, we hardly ever do that mm -hmm. because it's just like this ratcheting up. Um, and you can move further and further away because you, you get into this. Um, yeah, you get into the situation where you forget the original purpose. So I definitely think that's a problem. I think there's an example we have in um, a report that Mike and I did. You know, Mike's great song song at IFG was a report called Policy Making in the Real World. And there's a really interesting example there of a ministerial meeting with a minister sitting and the, all the officials discussing how to implement some policy. And the minister suddenly says to the sort of officials, do any of you think this is a good idea? Should I be doing this? <laughs> So the officials say nothing. And then he says to the most senior official, if you were me, would you do this? And the official goes, uh, no. And that sort of then breaks the dam and the sort of, you know, everybody agrees that actually, why on earth are we doing this? We're all like hamsters on a mad treadmill and we're all doing that. And I think actually one of the really interesting things, my take out from the miners example, uh, which I got Mike to put in, because I said, I think there was something with the miners back, back then, because Mike doesn't remember that at all. Um, was that the, my take on it was that the DTI people had spent all their time and effort getting a great deal for the miners who were inevitably going to made, be made redundant out of the treasury. And they thought they were presenting a great package, but they were starting from a completely different place from where the public was. 
And that's one of the real problems within government is that government has a snapshot at the end of the process. That's where we've got to. We've been through a journey, but the public's not been on that journey with us. And you, that mismatch, I think, is why so many policies prove, you know, the, why are you doing this in the first place question, uh, where the test of could you explain to your mate in the pub why this makes sense is actually a very good test, I think, before you present your very elaborate solutions. Robert Hazel, I'm going to give David Halpern the last word. Robert, last question, and then David, I'm going to... Robert Hazel and Philip, here at the IFG. I have a question for Mike. Could you tell us a bit more about what you call, you call intergroup opposition, um, which was on your first slide? When I reflect on my own career in Whitehall, all the big policy issues I was involved with involved really big battles, and sometimes they were just turf wars, but uh, very often they were big <coughs> policy battles um, between departments. I'm sure Polly still bears the scars on her back from Nick Clegg's endless battles with the Home Office um, during her time. So, um, can you tell us a bit more about whether your report has any behavioural advice or insights about wars in Whitehall? Okay, Whitehall wars. They never happen, Robert. Never anymore. Yeah, um, so I mentioned very quickly, this is where you, um, you sort of have this uh, almost instinctive view that the other department's not on my side, therefore I'm not, I'm not going to really listen to what they're saying. And I think one really interesting way this works is because um, you tend to think that the way you view the world is unbiased and that if other people got the same evidence, they would think the same way as you. Um, and so if people don't have the same perspective, you think, oh, it's because they're biased or they don't understand it. We have to basically denigrate the other group in some way, um, which means that you may not listen to them. And I think what also happens, really interesting, this idea of what's called false polarization. You think the other group is more different from you than they actually are. Um, so you, you see this, um, it's often called this the, the devil shift. So if you have two opposing groups in policy, they think the other side is really awful and really different from them. And that means it's much more difficult to actually have a dialogue and understand what's, what's going on. Um, I think it's really hard to, to deal with this because it's often really ingrained and we don't realize yeah. it's happening. We talk, about, we talk about the red teaming stuff in the sense of like, how do you reject, how do you counter the desire to reject what that group is saying? So that's our main kind of pragmatic response to that. Um, I think also you can, there are two different kinds where there's the kind you get within government as it were, and then there's the kind you get in the wider pluralistic debate between groups. And with that wider debate, I think the reframing stuff we talked about is so, really... So, Polly, you were trying to make government work with two parties, which yeah. isn't something we've had to do in peacetime at any other time. So, how no, do you cope It turns out it's easier than trying to make government work with only one. <laughs> um, I think, I think um, departments do go to war. Uh, it, it was interesting, sometimes the interdepartmental wars were bigger than the inter-party mm. wars. So, mm. you would get endless mm. sort of debates on social mobility between... Michael Gove and David Willett, but who had just had a different view about how directive you should be to the school system. Mm. Um, and yeah, of course, the, the, the departments would entrench. You do get these kind of workarounds, like the health and work team between mm. DWP and health. Mm. But the problem is that then those sometimes sort of get sucked away from political ownership. Mm. And in fact, they become worse rather than better. Uh, and I, I think the times when departments do find a way to work together is often, you know, during a crisis. You know, COBRA is actually a really effective way of dealing with a crisis. So how can you, how can you bring teams together with high-level political sponsorship to deal with specific problems that last for a longer period of time? Because I think the health and work team, unfortunately, is a really good example of, of a team that is having no impact at all on a really intractable problem that we've been trying for 10 years and utterly failing to solve. So I'm going to offer my, my view, Robert, she said, because uh, I'm normally a co-author of this report, so I might as well. Um, I think there's a really interesting thing that I think all our structures entrench adversarialism yeah. within government. I mean, the fact that we label people, expect people to go, named as the Secretary of State, the department's really disappointed if the minister fails to push the departmental view. So actually, I, would, I think our cabinet committee decision-making system is completely bust and we ought to look at something else. Especially the um, meetings. So, especially the meetings. So I would start off with the first thing where actually you agree people collectively to define the problem. Mm 
You then remit it out to somebody, you know, to a joint team to prepare the best analysis of what the possible sets of solutions are to that problem, not as departments, but in terms of the government's objective as defined, and then they bring that back to people who are asked to part their departmental affiliations at the door, and it's made very clear that actually it's being a team player, finding the best solution for the government and the country, rather than winning a departmental battle is what gets you to move on. But that's just a quick suggestion. Tony. Just to, to uh, actually on yeah. that point, Jill, the evidence shows that, that people work. are... No, no, that mm. people are more competitive in groups mm. than in, as individuals, yeah. so that might work. Mm. So, so I have a small reflection mm. on this, a small point. So I'm a recent import into the civil service, and I spent a lot of time in the NGO world, and, so, and something which became current in the NGO world and in meetings, which doesn't happen amongst officials in their meetings, which I think is extraordinarily valuable, is you start a meeting by essentially saying where you're coming from. This goes slightly to the impartiality problem. You're saying, well, look, my perspective and where I'm coming from in some fundamental sense is this, and it has a very powerful effect because what it does is it, uh, it, it means that when you find yourself saying things which are obviously self-serving, everyone knows that they are. And people can call you out on it. And even where you don't realize that what you're saying is self-serving, but everyone else knows, they've said, ah, oh, okay, this is your background, this is where you're coming from. People know that that's the case and can point it out to you. It seems to me that that's a very, uh, very powerful way of, uh, uh, getting, of, of becoming much more aware of these group uh, and identity effects. Okay, I'm going to call a halt to questioning there, but before you go, I just wanted to give the final word, not to any of the panels, it's a bit controversial and different, but uh, we're modelling different behaviours today, <laughs> but to Dr David Halpern, uh, the man who drew up the blueprint for the Institute for Government in the first place, was our for founding director of research and now, of course, chief executive of the Behavioural Insights team, as well as government of what works national advisor. So, David, last word. I'm not sure my comments going to be interesting enough to merit that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, there was just two quick thoughts. One really was, I do think one of the most important lessons from this whole area is a particular, um, if you like, we're overconfident about our interpretation of other people's behaviour which we see repeatedly in government. There's a very nice illustration, Mike didn't put it up, it's in the main report, but, um, from Todd Rogers and others, which is around defaults. So we've used defaults in policy. Yeah. One of the striking things when it was being discussed, yeah. for example, you may remember around the, the change for pensions, is that the department's estimates were yeah. so, we would say, far too optimistic about, sorry, um, they should say, in this case, too pessimistic about what the effect would be. They underestimated it would be. And in fact, uh, Todd Rogers did this very nice recent bit of work showing, in a particular example, in relation to free school meals and so on. When you ask uh, educational administrators how big do you think the effect will be on the default, which is an actual change which was then subsequently introduced around free school, whenever you kind of opt in or opt out, etc., they are just orders of magnitude off. So they think it would be like, you know, one and a half times more impactful if you switch it. Whereas like a 97 times, like it's like zero to 97% the effect size. Um, and so we should at least take that to heart about we are ridiculously overconfident particularly and get our estimates wrong about other people's behavior. Um, but the bit, my second point would be, I do think it's the report is also, we're, in that sense, we're kind of establishing that's very useful. But unfinished business is how do you move not just from practices into institutional design, which everybody's really picked up on. Um, we're still going to be humans tomorrow and the day after. So we design institutions around that, right? We can expect people to have bias. In fact, Parliament Mark's gone now, but it's clearly designed. We expect people to be partisan, and we design institutions to reach better you know, conclusions. But we can kind of incorporate some sort of science or method into that to in the design of our institutions to get us in a better place. So Alex being a fantastic champion about, yeah, we should in fact be taking bigger risks in smaller ways, that's a view I hold myself. <laughs> um, but that, if that's just a practice, it's very hard to hold the line. So the question is, how do you then institutionalize it in forms which mean that we will in fact hold the line? Or even in relation to groupthink, we know it's certain dynamics you know, sometimes you get group things, sometimes you actually, the w you'll never persuade yourself of something different, but other people will persuade you under certain circumstances. So this becomes a matter, actually, IFG and, and beyond, about institutional design. What do our institutions look like? And I think the report takes us so far there, but it's personally, I would say, it's still unfinished business to think that through, and what does that, does that mean? mean? Anyway, thanks for doing it. 10 years on from lunch, nice thing to do. Thank you, thank you, David. And I think, as David made absolutely clear, the real point of this report is to start a conversation. Uh, the first part is to raise awareness. 
uh, start the conversation about actually if these things are there, if they're meaning that we're making slightly less good decisions than we could, can we do things about it? So please continue that conversation. We'll try and follow up as well. But thank you all very much for coming today and taking part so much. And thank you in particular to our excellent panel for all their contributions. Uh, so thank you very much. And I know Polly has to get away. So. Thank you.